One of the things we've done over the last decade is once we realize that a team member isn't a fit at Med Fitness, we very, very efficiently transition them out respectfully, but we're quick to move them out of the organization. And that really enhances the performance and commitment of the other team members when they see that so-and-so wasn't committed to executing on key things, so they're not here anymore. So just recognizing that there's no need to negotiate with your team in terms of what the expectations are. Be clear, be consistent. If they're not a fit, they're not a fit move them out. Don't hem and haw. Don't play around with it. It's, it's better for your customers. It's better for your team. It's better for your company. Welcome to the Fitness Founders Podcast. I'm Kevin Mannion, VP Marketing here at Glowfox. This week we talk to Richard Wolf, the founder of MedFitness, a strength training studio specializing in on-demand personal training in St. Charles, Illinois. Richard has run his own business for 10 years and has more than 30 years experience in the fitness industry. He talks about his 10 second rule for customer service, the effect of two years of video blogging on his business and how to make tough decisions around letting trainers go from your studio. Okay, let's get started. Richard Wolf, welcome to the show. Kevin, thanks for having me today. So Richard, tell me a little bit about you and your background. Well, my background, my formal background is in nutritional science. I'm a registered dietitian nutritionist, which means I have a college degree in nutritional science, and then I complete a uh, further clinical experience in what's called medical nutrition therapy here in the United States. So it's a, it's a professional degree in nutrition here in America. And so that's my formal training. Uh, and it, it's been good to have that in the fitness industry because it's it's very uncommon over the last 30 years that people in this industry have that, uh, that degree of training in nutrition, even though that's not our core business necessarily. Yeah. And like, I definitely want to dig in a little bit later about around how that fits into your overall training programs. You started your first gym, I think you might've been age 13. So that, yeah, that was a that was an early start. Do you want to just tell me a little bit about your overall career to date? Certainly, yeah. So when I was thirteen, we I created what we called at the time Wolf's Gym, which of course is my last name. My my three brothers and I we were all passionate about lifting weights, and so I created a little home gym in my parents' basement in 1976, and uh, that was the the birth of everything. That became the place to work out for the neighborhood kids for friends through grade school, high school, college, and it became a pretty complete home gym with all sorts of amenities, but we trained there for years. And then of course, went to college, uh, studied nutrition. And as I was in college, I, I started working at the YMCA. Uh, so that was my first formal job in the fitness arena as I was working on my degree. Once I graduated, I worked as a dietitian in a medical setting, and uh, within about a couple months probably of graduating, my older brother asked me to join him in business. That would have been in 1988, and he had just purchased a small little studio, uh, actually a Nautilus uh, facility back in the day when okay. Nautilus was becoming known in America. Uh, and so I started working with him part-time and that eventually led to full-time and we were in business together for 21 years. We had three locations. Uh, our core business was really high intensity strength training, but we did some other things in fitness as well along the way. And over the last decade, I've been on my own and that was the creation of Med Fitness, a, a studio about 2,000 square feet where we offer the service that we call on-demand personal training, which is personal train without appointments or high prices. So that really is our niche, of course, uh, strength training, um, efficient workouts and on demand personal training. So um, very unique, it allows us to really leverage our position uh, in our community and in the industry as well. So uh, that's where we are today and super excited about the work that we're doing. So you have the I think the training sessions down to to 25 minutes. Do you want to just tell us how yeah. that works and you know, what people get done in, in that amount of time? Yeah, they're doing a full body workout, Kevin. So typically it's eight exercises. We're using MedEx strength training machines. So okay. that allows us to be efficient with the flow of clients. We wouldn't be able to do this if we were using dumbbells and barbells, but with the MedEx machines, you're training your abs, your chest, your shoulders, your back, your legs, 
uh, with eight exercises. And the trainer's job is to coach you through that session, keep you moving. And we call it keep the line moving, which is to be able to move efficiently from exercise to exercise without waiting. So they're training. We train slow. We use the, the super slow protocol as sort of our base protocol. So people are lifting and lowering the weight in 10 seconds. So it's okay. a it's a very deliberate workout and we'll mix it up with some other protocols but that's sort of our standard go-to uh, so you're doing those exercises you're on the machine for one to two minutes working near or to muscle failure and you're out of the studio we have what we call the 10 second rule at med fitness which simply means when the client walks in the door the trainer's job is to get to the front of the studio greet them get them started within 10 seconds and get them rolling on their workout so efficiency is really a, a cornerstone for us and allows us to keep people on a consistent basis because it is so darn simple and efficient that, um, you know, they, you'd be foolish not to continue with it. So you're passionate about strength training and, you know, you've always been passionate about strength training. I think you, I've heard you refer to it as life saving medicine. So do you want to maybe just tell me a little bit about this passion? Why you think it's so effective strength training? Yeah, the passion for strength training really comes. I tell people that I was born with it because as a very young boy, and again, it goes back to growing up with my brothers, we were all just obsessed with lifting weights. Now, a lot of young boys throughout the world are obsessed with lifting weights because we like the idea of big muscles. We mm -hmm. wanted to be strong for sports. We, we liked the muscle magazines. We were very interested in the bodybuilders of the day of 1970s and 80s. So that seemed kind of natural, but it, that drive and passion continued into, uh, you know, teens and 20s and so on. And now, as you know, Kevin, for the first time in the history of the world, we have this field called lifestyle medicine, which is just use of evidence-based exercises and nutrition to treat and prevent chronic illness. And of course, strength training is front and center in lifestyle medicine. So we have sort of this gift put into our lap, something that we like doing as kids yeah. is now regarded as best practice lifestyle medicine. So we get to do it uh, professionally and it's just very exciting and incredibly rewarding. How does nutrition come into what you offer your, your customers? You've obviously got a big background in that. Yeah. Uh, how does that work? Yeah, what we do, uh, the primary way it comes into interplay is, is through our weight management coaching that we offer as an adjunct to our, our membership. So okay. uh, we're working with clients and, of course, a high percent of them want some guidance and help with managing their body weight, losing fat, and so on. So we have a weight management program that we offer in addition to our, our strength training membership. And not everyone uses it, but a significant portion do. Uh, we have some meal replacement food, shakes, entrees, nutrition bars that are tools to be used as an adjunct to the healthy eating guidelines that we're providing clients with. And so that becomes, of course, part of our business model as mm -hmm. well that service and, and those products, those foods are items that we do sell in the studio. But the core business is overwhelmingly our strength training membership. That's really where we eat, sleep and breathe. And, and that's where we succeed as a business more than anything. So, you know, you've been in business for a long time now. Um, yeah. I'm keen to dig into this business model. So uh, you talk about having a membership, but then as well having this on demand training. So how do right. they differ or are they the same thing? Yeah, they're really the same thing, Kevin. The we we used to call it membership-based personal training, but okay. uh, since adopting the the soundbite on-demand personal training, yeah. if you came into the studio, you'd have a couple options. You could train with us, get eight training sessions uh, a month, you know, two a week, for uh, a price if you commit to a year, or a higher price if you're just going month to month. Mm -hmm. But the how we describe it to people interested is we let them know that this is about 60 percent less from a price standpoint than conventional appointment based training yet you have a trainer coaching and guiding you and supervising you every time you're here so it really is enormous value on that level and you add the flexibility of not having to set an appointment it really becomes a super unique service that most of our clients, pretty much none of our clients have ever seen anything like this. So uh, they're happy to enroll. Typically, we have a very good uh, closing rate when someone sits down and goes through our free trial workout. 
but it's just um, you know so different and so unique. And once they know they need to strength train, it would just be foolish not to have this uh, as an option for yeah. them. Um, given today's world that we live in. Okay. And um, so strictly from a business model perspective, you, you've on demand, but it's, there is a minimum commitment there of yep. a month. Um, yes. And then you have yep. things like the weight management that are effectively are add-on programs. Correct. Um, and then Correct. you have nutrition bars and other bits and pieces that also, yep. uh, I suppose, right. are other revenue sources for you. Have you always... I suppose, <clears throat> innovated and had multiple revenue sources? Is that something that you saw working in other places or something that you came up with yourself? You know, we we, we sort of came up with that ourselves, but it was a long time ago. That would have been back in the early 1990s is adding that service and product line to the core business of strength training. And it seemed like a natural fit and, it's, and we've just sort of honed it and refined it over the years as well. So um, we do some additional teaching and writing on those topics of nutrition. Again, always sort of woven back to why our clients are here, which is strength training, but um, we provide what we would consider you know, good evidence-based guidelines so that they can be practicing relevant things and not being distracted by all of the noise that is yeah. uh, common in our world today. Are you in a competitive area? Like I know you're in St. Charles, Illinois. Is there a lot yeah. of other, I suppose, similar offerings on this down the road i'd say it is competitive from a personal train standpoint there are other boutique uh studios and spas in the saint charles area and there's other plenty of other personal trainers typically smaller businesses so there's there's good competition but we're fortunate because that no one has this system where you're with the trainer you're paying a very affordable price and you're not setting appointments so that allows us to really stand out in the marketplace okay. So you you feel like you've got something that fits into how people want to buy and how people want to train. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, think about it, Kevin. If you if you walked into our studio today and you you're 65 years old and you've never strength trained in your life, but your doctor says you need to strength train, and the idea of personal training has never even registered yeah. on your brain. Sounds you scary. Just yeah, you. Uh, what do I, I have no idea what to do and how to do it. So you guys will coach me. I come when I want. It's a reasonable price. So of course I'm going to say yes to that. So we feel that that model is well suited for today's society. So, so I'm fascinated by this. I think you said it was a, a 10 second rule. I think probably everybody who's listening to this would like to have a 10 second rule or would like to have something where you get yeah. this greeting when you walk in the door. So two questions. Is this something you've always had or do you think it's something that is more needed nowadays than it used to be? Is my first question. And my second question is how do you actually make sure it always happens? Yeah, we have not always had it. I think that it's an outgrowth of our desire to serve our customers and knowing that one of the things that is the kiss of death and service is waiting and not being acknowledged when you walk into a business. So the moment someone walks in the door, uh, we want to acknowledge and let them know I'll be up there in two seconds or three seconds and or I'm on my way and uh, they know that they're being taken care of and they feel like they've made a good decision the moment they walk in the door because they're connecting with the trainer almost immediately. So I think that's important in today's environment of competition for five-star customer service the way it is. So um, I don't know if that would have been the case 20, 30 years ago as much. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And how do you, in what ways do you engage people when they're outside the gym? Do you kind of keep in touch Yeah, text messages or what, what do you do? Yep, we have a couple of, of mechanisms there. We we host monthly seminars that we invite our clients to. In fact, we've got one tonight. Okay. Uh, those are outside of the studio and those are really designed to add value to their membership with us. We're talking about topics related to their strength training and Sometimes it's got a slight weight management uh, approach to it, which is our topic tonight is called fat mythology. So we're talking mm -hmm. about fat myths, but right. so do lectures. Uh, we also have, um, we're working on putting together a podcast. Uh, so yep. we want to get that up and going. And we write articles, one article a month on a key topic that we're handing out and is going out through our electronic email newsletter, uh, which goes out to them weekly. And then our, we'll probably get to it later, but the whole Train Like a Champion daily videos 
is a birth of that connection, Kevin. We wanted a way to have a conversation with our clients every day, and we sort of fell into this one minute a day video chat with them through the Train Like a Champion blog. So, uh, so we try to keep our hands on them on at multiple levels uh, throughout the month, even if they're not in the studio. Yeah, it just shows you the number of channels you need to be active on in order to keep hold on to customers and keep them engaged. Yeah, you're right. Yeah, it's you, you got to pay attention to it. It's it's easier said than done, but it has to be done. Yeah. So the first thing I noticed when I went on to your, your Facebook page was you're on, I think you can probably tell me day 600 in a round of a video series. So tell me about that. So I've been one of the things that I've been doing for years, Kevin, is speaking. I've traveled around the country. I've probably spoken in every major city in the United States. And so I've done a lot of seminars, workshops, uh, presentations. And so I've always been comfortable speaking. And I was listening to a marketing guy on YouTube. Maybe you know him. His name is Gary Vaynerchuk. Yeah, I know him well. Yeah, so he has been big. One of his messages to his viewers for a long time has been, you just need to get started with yep. what you're doing. And if you're comfortable being in front of a camera, then you need to be doing a daily vlog. And so I one day I sat down on the chest press machine. I said, all right, let me just record something. And that was the birth of it. And, and my commitment back then was I thought, let me do one a day. It's not that hard to do. I've got a billion ideas in my head floating around all the time. So uh, now we're today was day 816. Wow. So we're not sure if it'll ever stop. But for now, it's it's a good tool for us. We're actually getting business. People are coming in because they've seen my videos on Facebook. They have no idea who I am or or anything about. They just know they need to strength train. And this guy talks about strength training every single day. So it's been an interesting evolution uh, from what I got started. And is it purely talking about strength training or do you promote your studio or how do you get that balance right? We do. It's probably a 95% just talk about strength training and nice. then 5% of promoting something. Uh, we started doing videos to promote our monthly lectures. And so I might do four or five one minute videos just talking about what we're going to talk about as a way of, of interesting people to attend that because we've grown that to invite people who aren't current members. So uh, we're realizing we can gain business through this. Uh, yeah. It's not a hard sell, but it's come and hear me speak. And the moment they see that, it's a real compelling reason why they would uh, be interested in more in what we're doing. So. so so this was something that started out as a way to engage your existing members, but then you yep. realized it was actually a way to get more reach and get more members. Yes, correct. Okay. Right. That's a good, right. I think that's a good lesson, lesson for us yeah. all. So change of tack, you, you, yeah. you've mentioned already that you're in around 60% cheaper than, you know, similar gyms, similar competitors. So tell me about the economics of running a business like that. How can you maintain that type of price yeah. difference? That's a real good question. Uh, so our model, when we look at our cost of goods, we have with the on-demand training, we have one personal trainer that is working what we call a shift. So okay. the shift is typically five hours long. Yep. And when I'm working a shift, my job is to be uh, providing, we call it our supervision system, but it's really world-class supervision. So it's coaching, guiding you through the workout, uh, setting your machines, recording what you did, writing the next workout, giving you a summary of the workout, all these elements that we put into our supervision system. It's designed to have you have that perfect experience, that world-class supervision. And so one trainer is really hustling, moving quickly to service. Our average flow is four clients in an hour. Okay. So, um, so where we position ourselves from a business standpoint is I have, I'm leveraging, I'm getting that income of four clients in an hour and I'm only paying one trainer. I'm not having to pay four trainers. So that starts to improve our, our ratios when we look at our cost of goods and the percent that the business is, is hanging on to versus our uh, cost of labor. So, uh, so it works out pretty well. Um, we can sometimes see five or six or seven clients in an hour. Yeah. We call it the busy zone. And we have some adjustments we make in how we coach and supervise. But the, the people don't seem to mind if they know that someone has their eyes on them and they're managing the process. And if there's a, a workout where maybe there's just a tiny bit less touch one time because I had six people instead of three, yep. seem to mind that. So um, 
sometimes people are getting one-on-one training. They're the only one in the studio and they're not paying for one-on-one, but they're getting it. So there's a give and take to it. Yeah. So I could come in, do the whole circuit on my own, um, have full attention, or maybe there's three people on the conveyor belt. So, uh, but you're designing the, the coaching to cater to, to, to cater to those kind of numbers. That's exactly right. It shifts a little bit. It goes up and down, right? Yes. Yeah. Okay. Yes. You started this business about 10 years ago, which was really in the depths of the hard times economically. Why did you start then? And what did you learn from starting a business when there yeah. wasn't as much disposable income around? Yeah, that, the timing on that, Kevin, was that I had been with my brothers uh, for 21 years with them. And we just had some different views about business direction, business vision and such. So I wanted to go out on my own and I was going to just go start my own studio. But then uh, we decided that uh, they would sell me one of the studios. We had two at the time. So one of the business uh, operations, and that was the one in St. Charles. So we negotiated and worked through it. And I purchased that one from them and then just took over operating it. So there was an existing business, but that was in 2009, and we had lost some pretty significant business through 2008, uh, and were really um, having to operate on an extremely lean budget. Uh, I'd say the one lesson, uh, and not that I wouldn't have said it before, but to go through it as something different, the one lesson that uh, I think uh, uh, was reinforced is that if you have a ton of passion for something and you know you have something to give of value Uh which I knew we did uh, just keep working keep grinding keep pushing and if you can see some incremental progress uh, then it's worth putting your nose to the grindstone there was many days Kevin I thought we were going to close the business I thought that well I guess this is the week where we close we're just not cutting it we're just not gaining enough traction because business, the, the economic climate is so lean right now. We didn't really enter it with a, with a buffer. We sort of entered into it at a low zone. So, uh, so I did, I had that thought, but, uh, thankfully each, each quarter, each year was a little better, a little better, a little better. And we kept building momentum and we stuck with it. So I, um, you know, I'm excited today that I, I didn't, uh, sort of turn away from that lean zone and yeah. just do something I had other job offerings to go work uh, as a dietitian but I just turned them all down so and what's the difference what made you stay versus make you go and take those offers what do you think is that keeps yeah. somebody like you grinding right. away right you know what it is I'm very much a visionary guy I I really believe that what we're doing, how we've structured the strength training program and how we've structured on-demand personal training is literally something that you could equate to when Henry Ford created the Model T in the in the beginning of the 20th century. Nobody knew what it was to drive a car. We were all riding horses yeah. in 1905. Same thing here. Nobody, you could ask a thousand people, Kevin, do you know what on-demand personal training is? No. Nope. They know what it means to schedule an appointment. They know what it means to, to pay a lot of money for a trainer, but they don't, no one has experienced this. So I just felt like it was our gift to the industry and to the world to make it work. Even if it's not us, if we create a model that is, can be used as a template for others to learn and adapt and do similar work, then that's really our gift to the world and the industry is to drive this process forward. So that very much a vision sort of minded guy in that sense. I, uh, you know, sometimes you, you have to balance that, of course, with the practical uh, financial side of things, but uh, that really kept my heart burning strong during those lean times, so. You made it through the hard times. The business has lasted until now. Obviously, people have maybe more money to spend now, but what do you think yeah. has been the secret to having people come back over and over again and, and building that loyalty? What? Have you done yeah. to make sure that happens? Well, they uh, there's two two things that will influence their decision making. One is what is their customer service experience like, and I think that's just a statement of 2019 in the world. Uh, they have yeah. to have great customer service experience. They'll decide whether or not they're going to train with us based on our technical proficiency. If they if they believe that this actually works and it's safe and it's effective, they'll make the decision to w- work with us, but they'll only stay if we treat them 
um, like they're our family and friends and just treat them like gold. So we have to be, uh, again, five star when it comes to customer service and, and not take a single thing for granted. Everything from how the workout goes to how we manage their billing to everything operationally has to be just flawless for them and they need to be treated like they are a our guest our special guest every time they're in the studio so i think it's that high touch high engagement serving them uh we're there uh to serve them uh that's one of our core values is servant leadership so it's all about the customer it's not about us it's not about the trainer uh so i think that's critical for retaining them in in, in today's world yeah, so you, you would put that above, say, the cost, the yep. seminars you're putting on, yep. the weight loss add-ons, you put it above all of that stuff. Correct. I mean, in today's world, people want to be connected. And as you know, Kevin, people love to do business with people they like. So if I am treating you like the special guest that you are every time you're in the studio and just going out of our way to serve you, they get that and they, you know, people like it. So um, that really is the glue that determines whether or not they stay with us or not. So Richard, you know, you sound like you've learned a lot along the way, and maybe this is a bit of a, a cliche question, but tell me about a couple of the bigger mistakes that you made along the way. You know, that's, a, that's another good question. Uh, I think you, you, you have it in your head what you are setting out to do, and then you sometimes don't set the expectations as high as they should be for your team and your process. So I think one of the things we've done over the last decade is once we realize that a uh, team member isn't a fit at MedFitness, if they get through the hiring process, if we end up hiring them, but it becomes clear that they're not a fit, we very, very, very efficiently transition them out respectfully, Mm -hmm. but we're quick to move them out of the organization. and, And that really enhances um, the performance and commitment of the other team members when they see that, well, so and so wasn't uh, committed to executing on key things, so they're not here anymore. So, so just recognizing that there's no need to negotiate on um, with your team in terms of what the expectations are. Be clear, uh, be consistent, and uh, if they're not a fit, they're not a fit. Move them out. Don't hem and haw, don't play around with it. It's it's better for your customers, it's better for your team, it's better for your company, uh, and so on. So, uh, and move quickly when it comes to yeah. the lack of fit. Yeah. It's a hard lesson, but maybe it's a, it's a, it's a good thing yeah. to know. Right. Yeah. And who, when you're not there in the studio today, who, how do you know that the standards are high enough? In our business, we have a general manager, okay. and so she, she runs the show. Uh, my primary function, besides being the president of the company, is to really drive our sales. So okay. uh, that's that's my job. And so she has weekly check-ins with the team. Um, we have quarterly uh, training and uh, monthly team meetings. And there's a whole lot of, there's multiple levels of sort of support training, feedback, and goal setting with the team. So, and then we're very data-based. We're very objective about what's happening. So we're measuring outcomes on every shift, workouts, wow. progression, um, all kinds of metrics that allow us to get a snapshot of what's happening with our business from a from a data standpoint. So we're right. always looking at that. Is that around sales or retention? Or sales, there- yes. sales also, but workouts as well. So okay. we're looking at the total workouts, the workouts per hour. Um, uh, we call it average progression. The, yeah. The, the client's training load is being logged in the computer and we're measuring that. They're getting a progress report. We're looking at trends. Nice. We've got the goal set for the year in terms of progression. So we're talking about that at our monthly meeting. So there, there's a lot of measurement that helps us to say yes or no. Are we on track very uh-huh. quickly and easily? So, mm-hmm. yeah, that's good. Sometimes with a fitness business, it's not easy to get all those metrics in place and, and, and yep. get them accurate. So I'm sure there's yep. a bit of work in, in getting that set up and getting it running properly. There's been time, yes, indeed. Okay, Richard. Well, um, you know, I feel like we've covered a lot of things, um, mm-hmm. everything from the personal touch to the economics and how to be data-driven to extending out beyond the gym through social media. Maybe we'll just finish up then with, you know, a couple of tips for some people who are younger in their entrepreneurial careers um, looking to set up a business similar to this, what would you say would be two or three things that they should bear in mind before they're serious about it? 
Certainly. I uh, First thing I'd say is um, you want to avoid that temptation that a lot of entrepreneurs have is to be all things to all people. You have to, to be successful, you really have to drill down on some specific entity, whether it's a product or service. And the one thing that we've done for, that I've done for 30 years is we've gotten more specific and more specific and more specific. So when you're thinking about what you're passionate about, uh, try to keep it dialed in and very specific. Um, uh, we've wasted a lot of time and money over the years trying to do things that really weren't in within our niche and would have saved us a lot of time, a lot of money, a lot of sweat equity and so on. So, so think specific, think narrow. Um, when we look at successful people and successful entrepreneurs and even in any industry, whether it's business or musicians, whatever it is, if you're going to be good at something, you have to be resolutely focused on that one thing. You, There's no way you can excel in something if you're trying to water down yourself and what you do into five or six different areas. You know, drill down on something and stay steadfast with your focus on that one thing. And I know that's a little counterintuitive today where people want to do everything and be everything. Yeah. Um, so that's one thing I would say. And... Um, this gets tossed around as well and some people will say no and yes uh, my belief is that when it comes to your career if you're you're a business owner and you're an entrepreneur and you're starting in this industry uh, you have to have just mind-blowing drive and passion for what you're doing the when you think about the time that you spend in your career whether you're an entrepreneur or not it's it's most of your life until you retire so it's the overwhelming majority of your life is spent doing this so to really get good and to be competitive, you're going to have to invest a truckload of, of sweat equity. And so the only way that makes sense is if you love doing something. I mean, you can't just beat yourself up day after day after day yeah. because you're trying to chase money. You have to like what's happening. You have to like the process. I tell our team, you have to really want to serve people. You have to be people centric. If you don't like working with people, helping them, seeing them succeed, then this may not be the the the, the company for you. So you so that I'm just voting that they need to do something that you're just ridiculously excited and passionate about. Um, otherwise you, you may not make it through all of the all of the uh, tough lean times, hard work, challenges, problems, all the stuff that goes with yeah, it. So it's not worth it if you're not. Yeah. Okay, sage advice. Probably wrap up there. Before we go, um, mm -hmm. maybe just tell people they want to meet you, they want to get in touch. Where can you be found? Yeah. Well, they can. The easy spot initially is our website, which is medfitnessprogram.com. They can find out more about MedFitness. They can contact the company through the website. They can also email me directly at richard at medfitnessprogram.com. And then they can see me daily if they want uh, my daily vlog train like a champion is on Facebook if they just search med fitness on Facebook it's on Twitter at my med fitness it's on Instagram at med fitness it's on YouTube at my med fitness so we're on all the major media channels and um, they can see they can watch me there and they can always send messages and I like to respond to all of my um, viewers so they can always leave a message there as well so it's definitely it's definitely worth a look and i'll definitely be keeping an eye and i hope you get a few Good. more 100 if not thousand uh, thank you <laughs> shows up there thank you very much for appearing on the show you're welcome kevin my pleasure thanks for having me